Um, I've, been, I've been thinking about uh, simple things that are really hard to do. All right, I'm thinking about those kind of like simple things that actually, no, you know what, that's really hard to do. How many of you got a chance to kind of take in some of the Olympics this summer? You got a chance to take in some of the Olympics? I totally was digging it, just loving it, loving it. How many of you got a chance to see this guy? Yeah? Get a chance to see Usain Bolt? Okay, there's a, there's a guy right there. Turns out he runs really fast, right? And he makes it look so simple. In fact, he makes it look so simple that he's actually smiling at the rest of the fastest people on the planet as he runs past them, right? Makes it really simple, but guess what? To run a 100 meter dash in nine and a half seconds, that's hard to do. Simple things that are hard to do. Um, dropping off my kid at college. Uh, two weeks ago, Sue and I dropped off our youngest Caleb at college. Sounds like a simple thing, right? Just drop him off, then you take off, right? Well, that's Caleb there, that's his, his picture. He's going, mom and dad, get out of here, please. Please leave, right? Turns out parents, it's kind of hard to do. For different reasons, there's, there's some things that just, they sound really, oh, that seems simple, but it's actually hard to do. Now, in my opinion, too, really good teachers, really good teachers make it look simple, but it's hard to do. Um, how about like our new guy around here, Ian? You guys been enjoying Ian this summer? Doing a great job? Is he, I don't know if Ian's in the house or not. I mean, he gets up here and he's funny. I don't know about those puns. What do you think about the puns? few too many puns. He's funny. I mean, he's witty. He's clever. You walk away with a clear, big idea. And he makes it look, when he's up here, like really simple. Yes. yes. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, it's actually, because I'm trying it right now, this is hard to do. This takes a lot of hard work. You got to think through what you're saying. We have a whole team of people. It takes preparation. It takes practice to do this thing. And I mean, like, like, if I don't have these notes up here that our whole team put together, if I don't have these, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's a disaster. I got nothing to say. I got nothing to say. I'm done. I mean, this, this appears, I'm hoping it appears simple. But it's actually, this is something very hard to do. Whenever I get a chance to speak at a conference or like an outside speaking event, and I'll speak to a lot of leaders and stuff, one of the things um, that I always ask them so I can prepare, I said, what would you like for me to talk about? If I'm gonna come to your event, I'm gonna talk, what would you like for me to talk about? So I can, so I can really work hard and be prepared for that event. And one of the most common responses that I often get is they'll say something like this. Oh, well, you know, Dave, just share from your heart. <laughs> just share from your heart. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, hold it. You don't get it. This may appear simple, but this is hard to, if I just share from my heart, okay, if I'm just like all of a sudden talking off the top of my head, just whatever I'm thinking about right now, like if I was to do that right now, you know what I'd talk to you about? I would probably talk, because on my way out of my house, I'd talk to you about the chipmunks. Anybody got chipmunks? I got chipmunks that are underneath the, my front porch, and they're digging holes that are causing the, the, the brick pavers to kind of cave in. It's gonna cost me a lot of money, and I'm as mad as at those chipmunks. That's what I talk about. If I just kind of, you know, share what's on your heart. You know what's on my heart right now? The White Sox suck, <laughs> right? And quite frankly, I'm kind of worried that the Bears might be just as bad. Do you want 30 minutes on that? Not, not so much, right? If I'm just kind of like, oh, well, what do you just share what's in your heart? My wife, Sue, this week, she brought home these things. They're called Godiva dark chocolate pearls. Oh my gosh, they're so awesome. I don't even know where she got them, but we need like a whole like cabinet of those things, right? I mean, I'll tell you what, let's just do this. So I come down here, we've got a Bears fan. I come down here, I go, hey, guess what? What's your name? Mike. Mike, Mike just share what's on your heart. <laughs> Come on, just share what's on your heart. Easy, right? Yeah, simple, right? Simple, yeah. No. You know what? It's a hard thing to do. But here's the deal, too. I think something else that's simple, sounds simple, but it's actually hard to do, is this idea that we've been talking about doing this series of sharing your story, right? Share your story. Hey, why don't you just share your story? Just get up and share your story. I mean, it should be easy peasy, right? Share your story. It's your story. How can you mess it up? It's your story. Nobody can tell you about it, your story. But the truth is, there's two things that make sharing your story something that sounds simple, but I think is actually kind of hard to do. And, and, the, and the two things are, are, are really this. It's about how to tell your story, but then secondly, we're gonna talk about this today, when to tell your, t tell your story. Now do me a favor. Go ahead and um, there should be one of these, I think, right in the, either on your chair or in the chair right holder, in the card holder right in front of you. Grab that. For the last two weeks, we've given you these things. And what we've really tried to do is to say, hey, you know what? Every one of you, hear me on this. This is really important. Every one of you have a really important story to tell. 
You have an important story to tell. There's ways that God has taken the pain in your life, the mistakes in your life, and he wants to redeem them for great good, and he wants you to be able to tell your story. And when you tell your story, I think God uniquely designed your story to help someone else either redeem their own pain or avoid that pain. Did you hear me on that? And that's a powerful thing, your story. You, you specifically you, your story. But your story is only powerful when it gets told, when it gets released. So how do you do it? Last two weeks we talked about this. Here's how you do it. Three steps. Makes it simple. My life before I met Jesus. Then we talk about what was missing, what I needed, my situation. Then we talk about how I met Jesus, the people, the events that caused me to become a Christ follower. And then the last thing we do is we talk about my life since I met Jesus. And and basically talk about kind of the the benefits, how my life has been profoundly changed since I became a follower of Jesus. Now, I didn't teach the last two weeks. I was was sitting out there like you all, except I was at our Yorkville location and our Plainfield location. And it was awesome. I was looking, hey, this helps me put together my story in a very concise way, and I know how to tell it, how to tell my story. The Apostle Paul, he understood how important our stories are And he was no different than you. You have an important story to tell. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says this. He says, but my life is worth nothing. He's basically my story. The story, the pain, the hurt, the things I've overcome, it's really worth nothing unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, which is to share your story with other people. Because the work of telling others about the good news, the redemption that I've experienced, okay, is all about the wonderful grace of God. Paul knew that he had an important story to tell, and so do you. And that, that outline there is how you do it. Now, today what I want to talk about is when. Because what I've also discovered, it's also important not just to know how to tell your story, but also when to tell your story. When I was just getting started in ministry, um, I love to tell my story. I love to tell my story. Anybody, everybody, I was super eager. Also, I was super eager to help other people learn how to share their story with other people. And when I was first getting started, I actually, I was doing student ministry, like Jordan Berry does here. I was doing student ministry. And I remember I would actually kind of apprentice other students, high school students, in how to share their story. One of the guys was a guy by the name of Paul. Paul was a guy who was kind of an extrovert like me, and he also loved any chance to share his story with anybody else. So we were a little bit dangerous together. Um, In fact, what we used to do, what we used to do, if someone would come to our student ministry, like to our, what we call Stuco here, if they were there for the first time, we would actually that week go to their house unannounced. (laughs) I know you guys are already cringing. Knock on their door and say, hey, look who's here. (laughs) And and, and if given the opportunity, if they would invite us in, I would share my story with them. Not only would I share the story with them, but I'd also tell them about Jesus. If they wanted to say yes to Jesus, I'd let them, I'd lead them in a prayer. If they wanted to get baptized that night, I'd bring them back to the church. We'd baptize them that night. It was like closing sales, okay? (laughs) Sorry. And in fact, so much so, we, we, actually, we were actually trained to do this. If someone came to like our, our student community, we would go to their house, but if they weren't there, then we'd actually, when we go call them that week, we'd actually go to the house on the right. Because we're going to talk to somebody, we'd knock on their door and then talk to them, just cold turkey. And so much so, if the person on the right wasn't there, we'd actually go to the house on the left and then talk to them. We're going to talk to someone before the night's over. Now, I don't, again, you hear me on this? I do not recommend this. <laughs> Okay, I do not recommend this. But I'm out doing this, and this has been a while back. I was out doing this, and so I knock on the door of this student who came to our student ministry. No, nobody answers. And uh, so what do you do? You guys have just been trained. Nobody answers. What do you do? Go to the house on the right. That's right. So I went to the house on the right. I knock on the door in the house on the right. Guy opens the door. I mean, huge, huge, huge hulk of a man. <laughs> and I've already been trained, so I start in on my delivery. Hello, my name's Dave, and this is Paul, and we're from, and before I get any further, he just blurts out, hey, I'm not interested, slams the door. (laughs) You think it's funny. (laughs) All right, and so what do you do then? The house on the left. So I start walking over to the house. Midway walking to the house on the left, all of a sudden, there's something inside me, and I look at Paul, and I go, you know what? I think we're supposed to go back to that house. We're supposed to go back to that house on the right. And Paul looks at me and says, are you sure? And I said, yes, I am. So we go back to the house on the right. I knock on the door again. The door opens. Again, it's the Hulk. (laughs) Lou Ferrigno standing right there, okay? 
opens the door, and, uh, and I started in my bit. Hello, my name's Dave, this is Paul, we're from, and again, he says, hey, didn't you hear me the first time? I'm not interested. Slams the door so hard, I thought the hinges were gonna just kind of come bursting off. Paul and I walk away. Now you think this story's gonna have a, have a happy ending, don't you? It doesn't, that's all there is, that's it. <laughs> that's all I got. That was the end of the story. It was a terrible experience. Thank you very much. But I did learn something, okay? I learned something that day, and here's what I learned. Here's what I learned this. And I think this is important for when you tell your story, okay? When you tell your story. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that was something that I needed to learn. So when do you tell your story? You tell your story when people know you really care about them, when they really wanna hear your story, when they hear about the life that you've, exchanged, you've experienced. And one of the ways that we've encouraged people around here at Community to be really intentional about caring for people, whether you ever get a chance to tell your story or not, but you do hope you get to, is what we call our blessed practices, okay? And these blessed practices, if you've never heard these before, these are revolutionary, I'm telling you, these are great ways to build relationship, great ways to care for people, and here, here's, here's, here they are. They simply are like this, it begins with B. B. B is begin with prayer. You begin by praying for the person. If there's someone you wanna really impact, you wanna influence their life, it may be a neighbor, a loved one, a family member, a person at work, you begin, you just pray for them. And you can do that every day. The second, the L stands for listen. It doesn't start with you telling your story, Dave. <laughs> It starts with listening, a listening kind of posture to get to know them. The E, this is a little surprise one, is to eat. And we're gonna talk about that one. There is nothing like eating together. They to actually take a relationship to a new place. And for those of you who ever dated, right, when you ask someone out to dinner, all of a sudden something different, a dynamic changes when you go out to eat. Then there's S, because after you've prayed for them, listened to them, eaten with them, they will tell you how to love them. Then you get the opportunity to serve them. Are you tracking with me on this? And then after you've done all those things, then you have the opportunity to share your story. Now what's cool about these practices, these are some things that we put some titles to, but actually we see this in the life of Jesus, and we actually see this consistently with, with the believers throughout the New Testament. There was a guy named Philip in Acts chapter eight, similar like me, where I was very eager to share his story. But the big difference is he used these blessed practices. He has an encounter with someone who is just kind of referred to as the Ethiopian official. While he's traveling this chariot, it actually begins in chapter eight, verse, uh, verse 29, and it says this, says the Holy Spirit actually says to Philip, Philip, go over and walk along beside that carriage. So right off the bat, right here, what we see is we see Philip begins with prayer because prayer, contrary to maybe the way some of us understand, prayer is actually a two-way conversation. It's us talking to God and sometimes God then actually speaking back to us. Now, my story, I began with enthusiasm, right? Nothing the matter with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm's good, but turns out, <coughs> prayer's a lot better. Now, maybe you're thinking like the, about Philip. They're going, hold on, I've never had the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, tell me to go anywhere. Well, let me challenge you on that. <clears throat> you ever been sitting at work? Maybe at home. Maybe it's even on your day off. You're sitting somewhere and then kind of almost out of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the day, a person, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor, this person just comes to mind and you're gonna start to wonder about them. I wonder how they're doing. Maybe I should check in on them. And maybe even later on you actually run into them and go, hey, I was just thinking about you. I think sometimes that's actually God kind of speaking to you, say, hey, Here's an opportunity, I want you to bless somebody. Maybe you're on Facebook, maybe you're on Instagram, you're kind of checking up on what's going on in someone's life, and then you, and you run across somebody and you go like, man, I, I need to give them a call, I need to shoot them an email, I need to shoot them a text. I think sometimes God works that way. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I, I, I do consistently, and I have a journal that I work with every, almost every day, and in my journal, on the lower left-hand corner, I write, actually write out this word, bless. And then I write down the names of people like, hey, God, here's the people, given the opportunity, I'd love to be a blessing in their life. And there's usually somewhere between a half dozen to a dozen folks. I try to be intentional about that. 
Here's what I want you to do, okay? Take your card, you got your card? You should have a pen there too. Go ahead and do that, everybody grab your card. Okay, because you're gonna get something out of this, you need to work with me on this, okay? So grab your card and grab a pen. And here's what I'd love for you to do. At the bottom here, we have five people I'd like to invite to show up Sunday. And what I want you to do is, okay, and I encourage you to invite those people for next Sunday, we'll get back to that. But go ahead right now, and I would encourage you, just let's say, who are, the, who are five people? that you really care about, that come to mind, that you would like to be a blessing in their life and even see them, some of them maybe find their way back to God. Write down their names right now, okay? Go ahead and do that, write down their names right now. I already, you can see I jotted down some already myself. Go ahead and do that right now. Here's the deal, I'm telling you, if you will begin with prayer, God will work in ways to create divine kind of appointments, to create promptings and feelings that'll lead you just like he did Philip. Here's what happens next with Philip. Check this out, the next thing. The next thing he does is he listens, and here's where, here's where we see it in Acts chapter eight, starting in verse 30. It says this, Philip ran over, because God had just prompted him. He ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Wow, isn't that kind of a cool thing? He kind of gets this prompting from God. He runs over, and this guy's actually reading from the Bible. Philip asks him. I love that he leads with this question. Do you understand what you're reading? The man replies, how can I, unless somebody instructs me? And he urged Philip, hey, why don't you come up in the carriage and you sit with me? and talk to me. So Philip, he actually doesn't share his story. He goes, hey, well, let me tell you. He actually leads with a question, and then he listens. He listens. One of the problems I think that we face right now is that Christians are more known for their talking than they are their listening. We're more known for saying, hey, here's the way it is before, we're ever asked, before we ever even ask a question about what's going on in someone else's life. My friend, uh, my friend Michael Frost tells this great story. It's a great story about a missionary. This missionary went to India with a great heart, wanted to serve the poor in this remote village. He shows up, and, and, he, and he's an American missionary, and he shows up with a tremendous amount of resources, tremendous amount of resources at his disposal, all kinds of supplies, programs, even workers he could deploy to take that kind of poverty-stricken village to a place of health and vitality. So he goes and he meets with some of the leaders of this village and he sits down with them and basically they live in kind of slum-like conditions and, 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 he, and he begins to listen, I'm coming to you and I, I, could, I could build a medical clinic if, if you would like to take care of hurting and sick people. Or I could build a school that could provide education for the next generation. Or, or if you wanted, we could build a church to, to gather people on Sundays to learn about God. What would you like for me to do? And the senior spokesperson for the village, this Indian village said, uh, could you build us a mailbox? The missionary was kind of confused. He said, a, a, a mailbox? Listen, I, I can get you a church, a school, a medical clinic. What, what do you need? And the spokesperson for this Indian village again spoke and said, well, could you get us a mailbox? <laughs> and he kind of, the, the missionary's kind of in dismay. He says, listen, I mean, I'm talking about like a, like a church or, or a school, a medical. Why do you want a mailbox? And as the missionary listened, the Indian spokesperson explained, he says, listen, if you live in a slum without a mailbox, what it means is you don't have a postal code. And if you don't have a postal code, that means you're not actually even on an official map for our country. And if you don't exist on the map, you're not eligible for any of the social service programs that our government wants to provide do you think you could get us a mailbox? Listen. The inventor of the stethoscope said this, said, listen to your patients. Told this to doctors. Doctors, you listen to your patients. They'll tell you how you can heal them. Here's the thing. You got people you care about, right? You got people in your family you care about. You got neighbors you care about. You got, you got people that you work with that you love even, okay, that you wanna reach out to. Here's the thing you need to do. You need to bless them. And it begins with prayer, and then it's listen. And here's the third thing. The third thing then is this. It's eat, all right, to eat. Now, as we kind of look at the story of Philip with the Ethiopian official, um, we don't actually see him eating. So you kind of got me on that one. But I, have, but I have this, okay, so it's a road trip, right? Have you ever been on a road trip without snacks? Right, so I'm sure there was some beef jerky or Skittles somewhere, right? <laughs> I, I, got a, I, got a text, I got a text this week from, uh, some of you will know this name, a friend of mine who used to be on staff here, Troy McMahon. And Troy reminded me, it was 20 years ago, 20 years ago this week, that I asked him to go out to, uh, to breakfast. And we started doing breakfast almost every Tuesday morning. And during those Tuesday mornings, eventually, okay, begin with prayer, at least eat. 
I got a chance to share with him my story about what God was doing in my life and how God was using me to help people find their way back to God. Troy was working at General Mills and kind of on the fast track. Troy ended up quitting his job in General Mills, actually came on staff here, planted two different of our campuses, and then several years after that, went and took a whole team of people and planted a church in Kansas City. That church in Kansas City that he started now has about a thousand, more than a thousand people with a couple different locations. He has started a whole network of churches that are now planning on actually planting a hundred churches across the Kansas City area. It's an awesome thing. And in some ways, yeah, you can applaud for that. And in some ways, I mean, I had no idea what would come out of a Tuesday morning breakfast. This, this, this is a, a powerful practice. We, we do this 21 times already every week. What if we begin to include other people? There's a guy named Lance Ford and Alan Hirsch. They wrote a book called Right Here, Right Now. Here's, here's what they say about this practice. I love this. Check this out, okay? If you, wanna, if you wanna actually bless people, he says that sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. I love this next line. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. <laughs> That's, I mean, that, that, there's a discipleship practice we all could love. If every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week, we could literally change the world by eating. How many can get on board with that one? <laughs> right? So ask yourself, who are some people that I can invite just to share a meal with. Maybe it's in my home, maybe it's out, maybe it's just a cup of coffee. But it always takes a relationship to a deeper level. Okay, so now you have Philip in the chariot with the Ethiopian, and now he finds an opportunity, the next thing, actually to serve. To serve. The official is reading from the passage in Isaiah, the Old Testament. He doesn't know that it's about Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus. The Ethiopian doesn't know this. So he goes ahead and he, he asks Philip, because he's right there with him, because of a prompting of God, because it started with prayer, and he says this, hey, tell me, was this prophet who was talking about himself, or was he talking about someone else? Now, Philip has the opportunity to help this guy. He's asking him questions, to serve him in a helpful way. Now, don't get concerned. My experience has been that when you serve people, it doesn't usually result in trying to help them figure out some kind of Old Testament prophecy. <laughs> Usually serving, what you're gonna find out when you get to know people, you begin with prayer, you listen, you eat when you serve, it's gonna probably be like um, your neighbor needs you to help them mow the lawn because they're gonna be gone for a week. Or you got a coworker whose car is, is in the shop and hey, could you give them a ride? Or there's an elderly person that you're really getting to know and you kinda wanna care for and you know what, just to visit them once a week or once every other week because they're lonely. That's, it's usually practical things like that. But if you're willing you begin with prayer, you listen, you eat. They will show you, they'll tell you how you can serve and love them. Well, then we continue. In Acts 8.35, Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian official. It now leads to a direct opportunity, okay, to actually share his story. He gets a chance to share, to, to share, to share his story. Let's go to verse 35, it says this. Then Philip began with, what, with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He told him how Jesus had made a difference in his own life. We go to the next verse, the next verse. The result of the encounter here, after he shares his story, here it is. Let's go to verse 36. I think we got it there, don't we have 36 and 38? There you go. As we look at that there, the Ethiopian official now says yes to Jesus and in that moment is baptized. Is baptized. I think there's somebody and chances are some bodies, many people, that God wants you to share your story with. The story of your own pain, the story of how God's redeemed things in your life to keep them from having to go through that same pain to show them how God can redeem their life. You know what history tells us about this event? History tells us about this event that this was the very first person to say yes to Jesus in the continent of Africa. The very first person. Did you know that right now, that the, really what now, they're now saying is the center of Christianity because it's the fastest growing part of Christianity is in Africa. There are now 400 million Christians in Africa. Patrick's over here. Patrick and I sat and talked to a guy from the Congo yesterday who's getting ready to plant all kinds of churches all across that part of Africa. They're saying by the year 2025, there'll be 600 million Christians in Africa. And that's where it all started. 
of the things we've been doing throughout this series is we've been uh, encouraging you by using this simple little tool to uh, think about who you're gonna invite to show up Sunday. And we're gonna start this brand new series next week. And here's the deal. I'm telling you what, um, I am so excited about this series. I, I promise you, we're gonna do everything we possibly can when the people that you're praying for, you're listening to, you're eating, you're serving, and you're looking for a chance to share your story with, when you bring them, invite them next week to come with you, I'm telling you, it is gonna be a great experience. Our welcome team is ready to welcome them and make them feel welcome. Our arts team has an outstanding, incredible experience designed for them. And I promise you on behalf of myself and John and Ian, the teaching team, okay, we will do everything we possibly can to make sure that when they walk away, they're like, wow, that applies to my life. That's gonna make a difference. So you tell you what, as a church family, here's what I want you to do. Take this card right now, okay? Would you just take this card in your hand? And if you haven't already filled it out, the five, go ahead and fill out the five that you wanna invite, okay? And here's the question, it's just a simple question. Are you willing to be a blessing? Are you willing to be a blessing in their life? And will you, yeah, invite them to come next week, but then beyond that, pray for them. Engage a conversation where you actually listen to them instead of trying to correct them and tell them where they're wrong to start off with. Eat with them, build a relationship with them, love them by serving them, and then as God gives you the opportunity, share your story. What we wanna do um, this morning is we wanna have just kind of a time of quiet that's gonna lead into a time of communion. In a moment, the ushers will come forward and um, they're gonna offer you a piece of bread. It's a reminder of the body of Christ. You can take that and just hold on to it. They're also gonna offer you a cup of juice, a reminder of the blood of Christ. Take it and hold on to it. And you know what this is? On a weekly basis, think about it this way, on a weekly basis, Jesus comes to you, doesn't he? And he invites you to find your way back to God. That's what's gonna happen here. On a weekly basis, he comes to you and he invites you to find your way back to God. And then as you leave this place, he says, now I want you to do the same. You go out there and you invite other people, right, into this place so they can find their way back to God. So I'll tell you what, let's just take a minute or two and I want you just to begin, we're gonna start with that first practice. You just pray for the people that you have listed here and then uh, in a moment the ushers will come forward and then we'll, uh, we'll all take communion together. All right, let's do that right now. <laughs> 